It's a beautiful sunshiny day in late February 2004 and our little corner hometown cable television Calvin Castine and me Gordy Little are right up here in Beekman Town off the Spellman Road at the Beekman Town Town offices for a wonderful reason today. If you like North Country history, you're going to love this program guaranteed. I spent 15 minutes with Clinton County and Beekman Town historian Addie Shield before the cameras began, and she has so many delicious papers and stories and maps and who knows what all to show us to prove that she knows what happened right from the very beginning at Beekman Town. For me, it's like uh, being a kid in a candy shop. You're going to see uh, some old contracts and some old treatises and various old paperwork that she's collected and photographs. She has done a terrific job in displaying these things for all the people in the town to see and through the eyes of Hometown Cable's camera for the whole North Country to see. We started our show with this historical marker outside uh, the town offices in Beekman Town, and pretty soon we're going to go inside on this beautiful February day to talk to Addie Shields and let her wax eloquent about the history of the town of Beekman Town. If the lady we're about to talk to is not familiar to you, you've been living under a rock for the last, I don't know how many years. She's my dear friend and Calvin's dear friend and a wonderful friend to the entire North Country, Addie Shields. How are you today? Well, thank you so much. It's a delight to talk to you. Addie has uh, been working on Beekman Town history for a long time and of course Clinton County history as well. And we've just been waiting to turn on the lens of that camera right here in Beekman Town. You have done just a magnificent job in preserving the history of this town. Well, we're happy to have you here because Beekman Town does have a tremendous heritage and especially to clarify with people the fact that this this Beekman Town is a colonial grant, but it is the second colonial grant. And traveling down to New York City to the Seaport Museum, but first to the Historical Society on Central Avenue, the New York Historical Society, I found these maps. And I found old William Journal, William Beekman's journal of 1767 through to the 1800s. And the important thing in that journal was that now, the Beekmans had come here in 1647 with Peter Stuyvesant. They, they were Germanic people, but it had come up to Holland and came across. They were mercantile people. And what they had done, uh, everybody, you know, you've got to have, you spend five cents, you've got to hunt around for another one. And so when they came, in their enterprising way, they functioned with the government, with Peter Stuyvesant. And they got, as time went on, <coughs> this is Corlier's hook over here. And they, they, in time, had a 20-mile stretch, four miles wide, from, from and their old, their old deed has from um, the wreck down here. Apparently, there was a wreck. And, <coughs> and as time went on, of course, they sold some of it. But if you go there now, if you go to Pier 17 in Little Beekman Street, at first they owned, um, as they sold off, but they kept for their business and for their storehouses because it was important to ship and for business. And you see, they 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 were into the East River. And you ask yourself, now why did they, well, why did they choose this on the East River if it was all open? Why didn't they char choose the Hudson River? Well, I believe that possibly the Hudson River, with the outwash from the Adirondacks, may have had more of a current. But anyhow, in that old William Beekman's journal, at first. They were, they were buying BBLS of iron and tremendous timbers and iron hooks, which I can't quite, I never can keep them in my mind, to, to, but it was the building. They owned lot four and a half a lot five because they'd sold. So then they bought back the rest of lot five and with all of their barrels of iron, and you see, you, you think about the current and the slap from the pressure of the, the waves and so forth, it must be quite a thing to build a dock. But anyhow, they built this slip here, which is Beekman Slip, 
right here and they built it out so it was 200 feet and you ask yourself all right so uh, they were into in this journal um, in uh, 1759 uh, Great Britain had conquered the French and Canada and all of the seigneuries from and we will look at that other map to show you all this the seigneuries were rescinded and so they were uh, smart in asking for and it took them 10 years to get our Beekman town see so the fall of Quebec is 1759 and they acquired this this colony up here, which was their second acquisition in 1769. And um, this shows you so well how this little favored area right in here that, that they own, 20 miles strip and four miles wide. And of course, as, as that was settled, they sold parts of it. This one, uh, well, their enlargements, there's two different maps here, but, uh, and if you go down there right now, <clears throat> the important thing in the latitude, uh, the Beekmans uh, and the South Street Seaport is here, and the trade, t Wall Street is right behind it, and the trade tower is over here. They're in the same latitude somewhat. Hmm. Now, from this other map. Oh, that's beautiful. To, to see North Country names down around Manhattan, All right. to know that's where it started. Yes, 1640, uh, in the 1647s with Peter Stuyvesant, and, and here you see is there Beekman Slip, and there is a Beekman Street along in here, and this South Street, and now as you travel down there, there is the Franklin D. Roosevelt Elevated, which is the speedway up here to, to, to go along that shore. And uh, at first, uh, at first it was interesting, uh, the, um, for that wharf they had dockage and people paid for dockage and um, so, um, and of course they had to wait for good weather and they had to wait to load and one of the things they sold was water and you never think about that but they sold BBLS of water. And this was in the, and of course if you're going out to sea you can't drink salt water. It's just amazing how people make a living. BBLS, is that barrels? Barrels, BBLS is barrels, <laughs> okay, yes. I got you. I got you. What else have we got over here? Well, let's go over here. Well, and of course, this is another one that shows you more clearly the southern end and, and so forth. And here's your, your slip. This one here. See, what, see the prominence they had? You can teach. You can teach almost anything from this map. This was given to us. It was old District uh, District 3 up here. But now you know when you go to Canada, when you go up to Canada, on your right as you look, if you pay any attention to the landscape, you've got all these straight lines. Those are rings. And this is our inheritance from Canada. This is this was the old Gautier's, um seigneury. And you notice it's got four miles of waterfront and nine miles inland, and then they took Denimoro off in 1854. And you can teach churches in this too. Now we don't have a Catholic church because, uh, and, and you get into the French and so forth, but when the French came down, the French came, everybody came by the waterway because all of this was a tangle, and you can teach the movement of the timber line across here. And since we're looking at maps, can we look at this one? Sure. We've had Everybody has good friends, and um, when you look at Long Point over here, Long Point, now see when, when, um, when Champlain came down, there's Point Rush right there. This business right here with Long Point, this of course got in trouble financially. You had three big people who owed the bank, and you know that's rocky and so forth. It is a good farm, and many things were tried there, as we know the duelies with Fantasy Kingdom and so forth. And the bank recognized that nobody but the state would buy that. Okay, but on this point right here, uh, eventually that became William Palmer's and William Palmer was the county judge and he had a daughter that married Barthoff, the colonel from the base and Barthoff had a chauffeur Mr. Forget and Mr. Forget so when when uh, Barthoff died and he didn't, this position wasn't there anymore he hired out to the um, express company 
the DNH Express Company, and, and you know right now we see all of the brown trucks around and so forth delivering everything, but in those days the things were delivered by railroad, and uh, you would see Mr. Forget out and around, and uh, somehow or other I came to know he and his wife, and they took me, uh, I, uh, they showed me Altona in the northern part, uh, because um, because uh, uh, his people had come from Altona and because he used to take Farjet up there in the area that Dr. Lewis has given as a preserve. He, he sh explained all of that. But anyhow, anyhow, this man inherited these maps. These were Barthoff's maps in 1879. They're the maps from Long Point. The, the, and of course, uh, way back when I first got into this, it's George Hallett that said, Beekman Town thrusts out and Alamont leans in. And the route, the, here's the route, and you know from over in the Reynolds Road you can see the route and that, that's the most wonderful place to see it. And, and um, the ships had to go around this. And you notice this promontory, that's why we got a lighthouse there. Can you see it? It's way out. The other part that this is good about is this little map of Plattsburgh. That's 1879. Now you do know that in the other, in the county office, we have the 1856, the O.J. Lamb, which pinpoints where people lived and does have uh, the breakdown of the streets. And then we got the 1869, but this is 1879. Somebody should enlarge that. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. So this oh, is. We are a colonial grant, though. The first one was the first Beekman is down there in Dutchess County, with. Um, in, you know, and it's only called Beekman. And that grant was, um, they never sold that land for a long time. What they did with that, they had tenants. And the tenant farmer, would, uh, there was um, the necessity that they had to bring uh, 10 bushel of oats or grain or wheat of some kind and uh, so many fowls and so many doves and eggs. And this shows you they were storekeepers and they were they, they sold. Now Great Britain would buy wheat and so forth. And um, so that all their tenants down at Beekman, down in Dutchess County on the Hudson River, that was the first grant. We are the second and, in eight, and started in 1820. Now we have our supervisors from our This, this is our present crew that was done in, as we turned the century, okay? And um, see Joe Giroux and Al Coran and uh, Mr. and Relation and Penny and so forth. And we are about to do another one. You see, you met Marie and you met Ruth Ashline and this little lady has left us. She is deceased. And uh, the lawyer. Laborando and so forth, Mr. Hay. But now Mr. Hay isn't with us, and this gentleman is no longer with us, and so forth. But you also met Mr. Relation, you see. Now, and so here is Dennis over here, and this is this is our list now, of all our supervisors. Now we now you do realize that photography started in 1835, so that you really don't have. We do not have pictures of these. Now there may be some somewhere, but I never was able to find them. And so we start with and Lorenzo Down Larkin. Now this gentleman, incidentally, that's the flatland. If, if when you go across the the Spelman uh, across the throughway, there is the big farm there that Francis Carter owns. Now that big flatland, this man, oh, apparently when he bought land, you know, it's you never know what what you're getting in a way when you buy land unless you especially when it's when the area is just opening up and he you know flatland you can make more money out of flatland than as if you get into glacial till where you have trouble marketing and he had became a teamster going up to Denamora because when they put that prison up there in Denamora in 1845 then you had to get wheat up there for bread and potatoes and so forth and he took this material back and forth and he became the supervisor and so forth all right as they as you come down here to Dennis. But these are our people who have served us. And we've had one woman. And in the books in there, this, um, with the uh, 150th anniversary of the Seneca Falls, uh, the women's vote and so forth, we started a copy of our making lists of our, our elected, our women elected positions. And so she's our woman elected positions. And Marie that you met is our other one because she's our town clerk. But then because of this, 
I've asked every one of the towns to put together lists of accountable people because these other people do, uh, backup people do a tremendous job too. <laughs> you spoke of, um, of the lighthouses. This is our relationship with Sid Couchy. <laughs> everybody oh, loves yes. Sid Couchy. And um, of course, uh, <coughs> There's Sid's signature with his, yes. with his trademark. We, we, sold, we sold a lot of those for him. But do you see, too, now how, how this thrusts out? But the lighthouses at first, you have to think of, of tonnage and what was happening on the lake. That when we got that railroad across the top of the state, which we should have mentioned that other one, when Bostonian interests um, prevailed, they lobbied for our legislature and in 1828 our legislature appropriated money for the surveying of that of that route across from Augensburg across the top of the state to take materials to Boston and so forth when they did that that pulled the plug the cork out of the bottleneck of the backup of wheat at Chicago because you do realize that in 1789 when they came through with the Northwest Ordinance and they opened up Ohio, Indiana, Illinois and so forth and those people all raised grain, what, how are you going to sell it? You've got to market stuff, you can't stay anywhere unless you've got a check coming. All right, and if you take grain and you ship it down the Mississippi and it's down to New Orleans, then you've got to ship it by, you've got to transship it to um, Boston. So when that railroad went across this at the top of the state, and here's your Ross's point. All right, then when they started putting that on boats to come down here, to go down the Hudson, because some of it did, and also for the farms and the, the cities and villages along the lake, then you ran into trouble with the weather. Do you see why you gotta have a lighthouse there? Beat me down, thrusts out, see it? And that also, in the old Burr maps, that's the bunting ram. See the, the head, see the ram's head, and these are the feet, and Cumberland Head is the feet, see it? And, and Point Rush Park is merely the whiskers, see it? <laughs> I love it. Well, and, and so in 1858, we did the, the three of them because these were problems. You do realize that um, uh, when, um, when in Valcour, when in 1775, 76, in the Battle of Valcour, when the fleet went back home, one of the ships foundered on that reef that's up there. And so Great Britain questioned, you know, Great Britain felt very badly about this, what was happening. And she sent William Chalmers over, and so there is, William Chalmers did, um, uh, what's the word for it, of the lake. He did a, um, the soundings of the lake and put out this book. And, but you can see that they knew that you needed a light up here because of that reef up there. So that the three of them, here's your windmill point, windmill point and point of rush down here, and the other one at the end of Isle of Mont, so that you could get down there to be safe. Can you see it? Now, the other thing is that when Bluff Point was put there in 1874, that's the last one. And by 1874, you had a railroad south. Uh, from Plattsburgh to Whitehall, you do realize that in the, in the um, Civil War, all the boys that went to Plattsburgh all went out at the, at the uh, monument there. They went by boat to Whitehall and then took the train. So it, by 1874, water transportation was maybe cheaper than the railroad, but the railroad was taken over. And just as uh, transportation is so important in the progress, and then you can see in the automotive stage, then in the automotive stage, you, uh, the railroads kind of went down. And right now, our Canadian National is making its money. Canadian National is really real great right now, and it's the freight that does it. Um, <clears throat> this is interesting. This is about a 198, and, um, and I don't think it's marked on here. And I'm, but, but these are, the, na these are the, the roads that you could travel on. The other ones, and if you look at the little white ones, those are the dirt roads. It says heavy red lines indicate dustless macadam roads. Yeah, it's all right. In New York State and fine gravel roads in Vermont. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, too, because we didn't have... See Beekman Town here? See all these roads here? Now, I know something about Beekman Town because we were in Farm Bureau, and Farm Bureau in the Irwin plan was responsible for the paving of these, and, and see all of our east-west roads were dirt roads. See them? Yeah. 
and the only highways were, and of course, these are the two, Route 22 and Route 9, were as they functioned with the, uh, the prohibition and so forth. Can you see all the little roads where in prohibition times, how if you didn't want to get caught, how you would be coming down each of these, you follow? And how you would come into these back roads to, to get away from the troopers? <laughs> and they did too, and we have, yes. we have collected now, many stories. In, um, before the Civil War, in 1850, John Benson Lawson went to, up to Canada, and then he followed the War of 1812 down. He followed the route down. And here is the church. Now, wait a minute. Can we see the church? Here's the church over here. Here's the church, which is a sail place. Now, John Ray did this. <coughs> And um, it does belong to the Clinton County Historical Society, and it's on loan to us. And uh, isn't it beautiful, though? Yes. And incidentally, uh, of course, there's all trailers are over here, you know, trailers. Oh, yes. But and, the building and, is still there. And, and, and it's and still the majestic, isn't it? Yes, huh? yes. And that's that's the 1833 church. But coming back to this other, <clears throat> there it is here as John Benson Lawson. Now, when he went through, I'm not sure how he did these lithographs, but apparently, I don't know whether he did them on site or he must have done them. These on are site. from Hurd's book. No, no, no. These are John Benson Lawson, which, oh, Lawson. and he did these from Hurd is 1880. This is 1850, and there's your Culver Hill. And see, that's why he did. He took this, and this was Ed Culver's house. Here's the original, William Culver, and then, and then Ed Culver's here. But, um, and notice how this, you know, we have so much uh, blacktop and it's so great and smooth that this is really good too to show you the, the, the terrain. And here are the, when people came to church, here are the church sheds to put, to hitch your horse in there and, and so forth, undercover. This is Alice Palmer's house. This is Ira Howe's. And um, one of the, there's the original one back here. Now this was the hospital. They t the British took the wounded in there. One of the things I want to do if you're free sometime is to go out and to show you this landscape exactly where these people when So when they came, when the British split in Chazy in the right wing of the British came came across 348 and came into West Chazy and, and were there for a time and then came down through there was another part when they got to this Ray Brook over here which didn't have a bridge over it they part of them came down the Ashley Road and when they came out of that <coughs> that uh, that clearing then there was an altercation and the wounded people were brought here in this house and this was our first hospital. This is Thomas Treadwell's map, and it catches, uh, we use it a lot of time for references, and the, the abstractors use it too in conjunction with their maps. But see, here was East Beekman Town and Beekman Town Corners, and you are about in here where the Spellman Road is, in here as you come across over in here. Can we look at, uh, can we look at the maps in the other room? Sure, let's do that. Yeah, before we go in the other room, though, I notice these wonderful photographs of the Lozier plant. Talk about it. Well, Lozier, of course, came from Chicago, and he first built, or I'm not sure, Detroit or Chicago, and he first built bicycles, and then they built boats. But why did they build boats? Because everything was water transportation, because the roads were dirty and dust dusty and so forth. So here, these are the first motors that they were building. Now these, these pictures, and see the, the windows, and, and this is that where Georgia Pacific is now, and Robert Weir sent us these because he had an uncle that was in this. He didn't know, he didn't know which person he was, but the blocks, the um, Gibbards later, but the, uh, Ross, had a contract and built blocks for them, and this is the first thing that they built down there in the Lozier. Now we're related to this through the Robinsons, and uh, th this is one of the first Lozier boats that was built here. And see the ends of them, how they're all right. And this was the um, the three families: the Robinsons, Will and Louis, and the Harrises. And here they are going on a trip 
and uh, see they're going into the locks, and here you are, St. Jean Quebec, down the locks, and here they are coming out of the locks. And I thought, well, it's it's um, uh, we're in our relationship here in Beekman Town. We're related to West Chazy. It's our northern boundary. It's where our people go to church, and this was uh, uh, two of these people were contractors up there. Louis Robinson had the big store and uh, the, uh, the other gentleman had the franchise to ship and so forth. So that, that's our somewhat of a relationship and it's for people who stand waiting for a town clerk something or other. <laughs> All right. And over here is one of our auction billing, billings which um, when Hector Chauvin, and incidentally, you just met um, Hector's, uh, one of the assessors is related, and so is our, so is this gentleman here, related to Hector. And uh, see, now, West Beekman Town Creamery was be so, being sold in 1929, and this relates to the fact in 1927, the Derrimans League put that row of milk plants from Champlain down through Chazy, West Chazy, East Beekman Town and so forth with their thermos bottle cars to deliver fresh milk into Plattsburgh. And you see, so when that way of marketing came in, this way of marketing went out. See it? 1927, the Germans League put that row of plants down. Do you see what happened? Sure thing. Huh? And look at the item, blacksmith tools, spruce planking. Don't you love it? <laughs> well, oh, and that's the other bit nice. too is that in West Beekman Town, they were up there on the timber line, and, uh, but you see what they had to, to use was their steam engine and their churn, and they sold a set of platform scales, and then and their belting, you see that, and, and cans, and it's interesting here, a pasteurizer and a testing outfit, and yes, yeah, spruce planking. You know, all farms had some, uh, you, you had some timber up overhead in the, in the woodshed. Uh, you always had some timber. You never used all of it. You know, you took a tree or several trees, and um, in fact, if you needed another barn, you were looking around in the pasture for that ash tree or that oak, and, uh, when, and then in the wintertime, this, if you don't have too much snow to travel in, you cut all of these uh, trees and so forth and took them to the mill and then when the miller, uh, now things have to go, well, I guess there is a mill here in Beekman Town, and then brought them home and then when you brought that, you kill dried them, you, you know, you never put, uh, you never pile timber close, you always put air spaces between it so it could dry out and so forth, but everybody had some timber in the North Country and that's what they built with or you wouldn't have had the money to do it with. Sure thing. Wow, the stone houses in Beekman Town. And before the camera turned on again, you were talking about the uh, the census and how they got information about stone houses and log houses. And there, there is an 1845 and an 1855 and a 65 and a 75 uh, New York State uh, agricultural census. And in that, it lists uh, there are many uh, charts, and one of them especially has houses where the people lived. And in our Beekman town, we had 11 stone houses, and so, and um, 85 or, no, we had 105 brick and 245 frame. But even in that time, we still had 87 log houses. We had, in 1875, and this is following the Civil War, we still had 87 log houses. But these are our stone houses, and so here's the one on Culver Hill, and here's the one down on the corner, the Farnsworth house, and then, this is on the Moffat Road, the party house, and this is up here on 22, the Dominey house, and this down on Point of Rush, the Moore's house, and this, we, you've already seen over there, the picture of Alice Palmer's house, which was the first hospital. Now this is a picture from the DAR that they caught in 1924. See the woodshed in here, you follow? And here it is, as it appears in Alan Everett's book, when it's a little more polish a little more time to fix and this is the Barnes House homestead and the web on Route 22. Now the web they've now put a little portico over here but our stone church and and uh, and then I plotted them on here to to sh and of course all of those were built about before uh, 
before 1820. And you think of when these people first came here, you know, you, you, think, you consider the winter we just had, the fall, and, and how winter came in in our fall and was terribly cold, that when people first built a house, a log house, and when they came, now generally men came first and built something, uh, generally they came the year before and threw up a building, but then it's very difficult. Uh, you consider how much you could do in the summertime and, and you had to bring at least two years clothes and you realize how you wear out your own socks and they had the dominies, the people that came in this dominie house right here, they have left us documentation. Now the dominies owned a, the Betsy a schooner that went back and forth to the Caribbean and um, when uh, following the American Revolution when Great Britain and France were having a tug of war and privateers were in trouble they sold to Betsy and they had come up here previously to obtain this land and uh, they built a small place and you really can't see it but the first part was was over here and later by 1800 now they came in following the war in 1786 but then you know it took them all at this time and this is fieldstone and this is random ashler and um he henry dominey that built this died in 1817 so that it's tough <laughs> excuse me but it is tough uh to to get a, a roof over your head in those days and mm -hmm. you wondered if you had uh, animals uh, actually there's a story of this from this house of how um, they had butchered and um, this house is right here okay but there's another road parallel back here it goes to West Shade Sea and the Spo and the Shaws lived over here and so they started over here with some meat and the wolves got after them and they had to have some help to the wolves could smell the meat, even you follow? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that uh, there weren't, it, it, was, it was tough. <laughs> and uh, you have to realize too that so they had a little, a little, their first little log house was right here, which they later uh, put into, and you can still see it if you go up there. It's Larry Gagne's house now. And uh, they framed over it and so forth, but it's built in. And uh, it, you could consider that so if they had uh, a team, or if they had a yoke of oxen or a milking cow, they had to put that animal, they had to build a little, a little uh, enclosure on uh, this uh, to keep the wolves and whatever from, from their animals. Oh, sure. Absolutely. You know, the amazing thing is there are still log homes in existence in Clinton County that we're not aware of because, yeah. as you said, they were framed in and covered, and now you can't tell that they were originally locked. Yes, that's, that's very true. Yeah. Uh, the other bit, too, is that, um, well, there's your church again. There's your church, and this little, and why this is here is, um, actually, I brought this for Gerald Luck because here's Gerald Luck's house, and here's Ruthie House Bur Barnes. But one of the factors that I, and see that rank of wood there? Yeah. Uh, I did something on the French, and when we, um, let us go and see this here, and I'm going to picture this here. You, you okay, know, we're, we're in the conference room now. You saw the stone church. Yes. Now here is, here was the first church. The first church was a Presbyterian church, which, uh, and these people went all the way into Plattsburgh, and they're seven miles from the church that started, which is there on Brinkerhoff Street. And this is, this, all right, the stone church that's out there. Well, this is 1817, but then it burned and in 1876. But this group of people have, kept this church until in, 18, in 1950. And we had two. We had that stone one in 1833. Now, this picture was beside it for a very reason, because uh, we, we had many revelations from this. You know, you grow with what you find out. We received... This is a treasure. This is a real treasure. Right. This is the only old book that we know of. I, I believe there's a second one in the co in the college in special collections, but this is District Five, and we transcribed it. Here was the letter 
here was a letter asked us if we'd like it and I responded <laughs> and of course we, we would we had to promise to take care of it and it is kept in the vault I got it out this morning but then this we I worked with it and transcribed it, and this is the map showing where District 5 was up on the turnpike. It's up on the turnpike. And then, and then on the computer, and we printed it out so if people came, they could see and read this instead of handling that. And it was interesting, too, as we, the people who were trustees, then I looked them up in the census, and it was amazing. The families that continued, like Mr. Chesbrough, had two sons and eight daughters, and in time, that line goes out. There's a Robert Chesbrook in, in Plattsburgh now, but this other, this Moses Craig, his li line, he had five sons and one daughter. Now, however, the most important thing that came out of that book was that these were the these were the people that owned land. The only people that could go to that school were the people that owned land and that could bring, that could bring firewood. Oh, yes, that's another important thing that I learned about the old schools. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And the other bit is it's amazing when you try to read it, to transcribe it, how as they went on from one trustee to the other, his ability to write, and in fact, they don't start using commas until 1870. Two, honestly, before that, <laughs> and it's run on. That's yes. interesting all by itself. Right. Sure. Now, I was doing the French at the same time, and so this picture shows us something. Because in doing this family line, this man who, is, who didn't die until 1929 was born up on the turnpike as the, and maybe we should, we should deal with that other map to show the movement of the turnpike, of the timber line up and so he was just beyond the turnpike which was where the timber line was his parents talked french and so when he was born he talked french and he went to he could not go to that school but over at twin l's one branch of the chazy of the chazy river the cudwiths built a mill there and so since they were in the timbering business and since it's, it's important what you're marketing and what the demand is what will sell and what won't Apparently he learned, he became, he started to become bilingual in knowing how to deal with the Cudwiths. And Nathaniel Cudwith in Beekmantown, we have no pictures of him, but Nathaniel Cudwith was an American Revolutionary soldier. And uh, so, and, and he apparently knew how to market, he knew how to build a dam, and, and had that sawmill. And his sons, he had two sons that worked with him. And so, this person here working with the plants, you know the plants in Champlain? Sure. Well, it's related to him. And why these, why these people came down here from Canada, from St. Jacques Le Achagon, up north of Montreal, they came because they had this cousin, this cousin, the plant, Peter La Plant, who was here. All right, as time went on, he was called in the draft and he went to the Civil War. And when he came back from the Civil War, he went up to Renfrew in Canada. And uh, he, they were there a winter, and they came back, they had just $50 left. And somehow they came down here to work for John Ray, and he became the sawyer in Ray's mill down over here, which I'd like to do with this sometime so I can show you where it is. Mm -hmm. And then, with a pension plan that started in 1896, he received $500, and he bought a lot from Mr. Miner of timber. And so... He built on uh, the house, I don't have that here, but anyhow, he built on the house and he built a barn, and when Matthew Howe's barn burned, he built that one. If, if we were out in the road, we could see the difference. But the important thing is that during the Civil War, he became bilingual, and then he became the sawyer, and he was a carpenter. He's listed in the census as a carpenter. And you can see that whole long rank of wood. And this son was an engineer. This, this son was an engineer on the Empire State Building. And he did steel structure things. Now his boys, because he was a sawyer in the Ray's Mill where they had a foundry, his boys puddled in iron. And the other bit of his life is that as he grew up, the railroad expansion and the telegraph was a part of, and he lived in East Beekman Town. And so when, when the Ray Mill did not have enough business to hire his sons, those sons took that, 
took that train out east Bigmanton and went down east and both of them were in steel structure work and so forth uh, so that a part of our French people who who at first somehow or other they became bilingual and they adjusted themselves to the needs of what was happening what where they could earn a day's pay I his name. What, what's his name? Is Louis Dupuy. Du, du, Louis oh. Dupuy. And his son John. And the horse is named Kit, it says on the picture. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. A lot of... Um, of course, there's a tremendous influence from north of the border. Huh? Absolutely. This, that's what this and, is all about. And this is the island... You know, when you go to Quebec City, that's a high bluff, and you've got to get up there. But this is the fertile island This is kind of in the mouth of the St. Lawrence River where our people found the privilege of uh, planting something and having it respond and having it food. And all of these pinpoints, this is a very important map because it, these pinpoints are listed here, and people can relate to it, um, the French names, the La Plants, and so forth, as to where they lived when they first came here. There are a lot of local names that are represented. Yes, the Chauvins and and the Rousseaus and the Delards and the Duponts and the Curés and the Dion's and the Fauchettes and the Turcots and the the Laplantes. See Claude Laplante here oh, yes. and the Turcots and so forth. So many people come <coughs> and relate to it and use it in their genealogical bit. We've been very happy with our. This is beautiful, with our this, case. this display case. And I left this here waiting for you people because these are the Christmas mementos that have come to us from the White House Society, the Historical Association. Every year they put out one of these. And how I happened to come by them, we had a gentleman, Mr. Jorstab, who who was on the committee, uh, the base committee, and he said to me that he was the person who was against their closing our base. But anyhow, because he's a dominie, they were sent to me at the county, but because he's a dominie, I brought him here because this is where the dominie's location. This is the one for this year. The children love that, and they love the little, the little... Uh, oh, the carriage. Yes. And that one probably fits right in there That's in the back, right. right? That's right, absolutely. Absolutely. Those are really quite nice. And of course they're clustered in with this, our, our culver things. Now these were given to us and we promised to keep them on display. And they were found in the Culver Hill uh, up there in the house where Mr. Crosby lives now and where the monument is at the battle. And I've been very happy with them. Tell uh, people about the battles and yeah, not everybody's as smart as we are. Well, you know, we've we've talked about Culver Hill, but a lot of our a lot of the people viewing this program may not be familiar with what it's all about. Even though we were, we were up there and had a nice ceremony uh, in 2003. Let's talk about it. Well, we put this together prior to that, so that our people, you know, history can be hidden. What I've attempted to do is put out materials in this building, so when people come in, there's something for them to be, to you know, it's continuing education, something to learn. And um, this was taken from an original that the Press Republican put out at the time. And, um, uh, and of course, uh, and see, here's your church. And this, the DAR had these two pictures. And this was the spot where he was, where Wellington was buried. And the other bit is the lack of the stone walls. People have, the men that, that did the uh, cutting of the brush said how wonderful that's an original stone wall. Well, you know, yes, stone walls are original. After you get a stone up there, <laughs> it stays there. With the exception of that now, when they did our, our roads in our town of Beekman Town, most of our road, most of our stone walls went into the roads to make them level because when you have a low place in the road, the snow will fill it and that makes it impossible. So that all of our stone walls went into the roads. And, and this part over here that the, our men hid in back of, uh, as the British were approaching here, those stones went to fill this gully in here. And, and this picture wasn't done until 1824, you see. So we really don't have a picture of that area, and we have to interpret what is uh, the, the written word and so forth. 
And this, this of course, was also done in 1824 with the church and, uh, and Ed Culver's house and then Mr. Crosby's, which was the original Culver. And this has a picture of the little store. This, this is the only picture we've got, that little store there. See, a little store. Mm -hmm. And aren't the, aren't the elm trees beautiful? We no longer have those gracious trees. But the important thing, too, this is the first battle. And uh, this monument was really put here as you look back. Those were the history buffs at that time. Mr. Kellogg and all of his people in the Franklin Institute, they were history buffs. You know, everybody's proud. You know when you earn a living, you get a little time, you go to church, you get a little time to sit and be quiet and so forth, and, and you think of your past. And so this is what they gave to us. They put together this monument, and it is interesting that Stafford and Rolson brought it here so that when we have a Culver Hill affair this next year, we I alerted both uh, Ron Wood and Cortland because their mother was a Stafford, their grandmother was a Stafford. And um, then too, Buzz Rolson is still alive. And apparently, Rolson and Stafford went down to the freight office and bought this and, and they first built the bottom. You, know, you, you have to put a platform down there. And they dug that out and put a base of stone. So those two men, Stafford and Rolson, so that we not only will have Culver's here and Dominies at this time, but we will have the Staffords, we'll have Ron Wood and Buzz Rolson and so forth. I've alerted them to it and said, please, <laughs> please make we'll, sure. And if, and if Annie says they'll be there, we'll hope so. you yes, better yes, believe yes. they'll be there. Yes. Well, have we seen everything in that cabinet over there? There were lots of things we didn't, you didn't point out to us. Uh, there's just such a, a marvelous display. We have some photographs in the... All right, the, those are the original the Culver's. Culver's. That's Francis Culver and his wife. And, um, and then this is our credits to... And it, Mr. Forgette, this is a Culver for Mr. Forgette's. We are very indebted to Mr. Forgette for, because he gave me all those, his son brought me his Forgette's materials that he wanted added shields to have and I could do with as I pleased. And so that, you see, that's the only picture of the Culver house that's on a postcard too, okay? Uh -huh. And it has the Kent Lord house and, the, and Mr. Moore's house. And then these others are later pictures. And you see, now the Culver house, as time went on, got into a deplorable state. The, the Fishers and the Webbs lived there. And if you go to Shazy, the, the spinning wheel out of that house and the loom are up there in, Chazy, in the Alice T. Minor Museum because um, uh, Annetta, Culver, who became a Webb, had Louisa Webb, who married Mr. S who married uh, Stillwell, a blacksmith, and um, so these are, those are the Fishers with Louisa Webb. But <clears throat> then, of course, these bits. Uh, you want me to get the key to this? Well, so that you can explain. To us, All right. You go. notice that shot and shell are different. Do you realize that with guns, uh, you have to you have to have a ball that fits the gun. And here are the different ones, and these were found in the culture plate. But these um, powder, these little pouches here for powder came from there, and the horn down here, and then the flute. Then I put the little old lady down there because, you know, uh, sometimes when they're putting something together, the person who who dresses up somebody for a picture, you know, they get everybody, everyone likes to wear a Victorian dress. but. The woman that was working, you notice her sleeves and her sleeves are up here, so you didn't sure. get the cuffs dirty. This is a working woman. There's one of your pioneer gals, and I put that there especially because of, of uh, well, bringing us back to reality of of uh, the work that pioneer women did in pioneer homes had a lot of they were menial tasks. You know, you went out and and. Um, even if you collected hen's eggs, you know, you reached your hand in there to get an egg out from under the hens, you know, and, and uh, you follow? You weren't sure? Sure, exactly right. <laughs> the hens would pick at you a sure. little bit. All right, and then they, they probably milk cows in those. I'm not sure who milked the cows, but if the men, and they probably only had one or two. Sure. They only many, had one or two anyway, one and, and so cows. that was sure. her working clothes, and that's why I put her in there. But here's the flute, and apparently these stirrups. Very nice, and huh? then the Indian arrowheads, 
the Indian arrowheads were found there. And in that box, that's their box, and there's some more, some chips and so forth. And I put them under there so they were <coughs> to be under lock and key and so forth. This is East Beekman Town Station. Right. And the first one here? The first and the only one. The only one because from the turn of the century until about in the 1940s. And then when the trains were taken off and when automobiles, see automobiles put this business out of business. All you need is a freight house. You see, and then this map is here because of, can you get this northern portion of this map? Can you get up sure. close to get this? Yep. And you notice that Moore's line and how you had Moore's Junction and, and uh, see how they had Canada Junction there, which was Moore's Junction, and then Beekman Town and, and Beekman Town Station down here at Spellman, see Spellman's Crossing and East Beekman Town. Yep. And actually, those areas had post offices too. So that I have tried to bring these things. This is a, a library atlas of the world. It's a 1910. And I've tried to bring these things so that people that came through could have, uh, you know, you, you think about one thing at a time. You think about one thing at a time. You're either into railroads or timber or whatever. <clears throat> Very interesting map. It's very difficult to, to get everything. And he was he was referred to that. I recognize that church, <laughs> yeah. you know, from Morrisonville, right, right? Right. Well tell me a little bit about uh, Phil White before well, Frontier. Phil now, Phil White got to be Dr. Phil White <coughs> because of the historical society and the Beekmans. Because as the Beekmans grew and they had all of these materials, they gave them to the historical society in, in Coopersville, in Cooperstown. And what they did, you know, uh, in order to have somebody work with them, they gave grants. And Phil White, as a college, Phil White was from Ohio, and as a college person, he did a six volume, uh, a set of of six, which has the lives of the Beekmans, all of the generations. And then he did um, the Beekmans in the transportation and commerce, but then he did this, which is Beekman Town. Now, it took him 10 years to get this published. I have an original of the manuscript, and uh, and uh, it was too, you know you have to market things, cost you money, and uh, he finally got, he teaches, he taught down there in Austin. And uh, see, University of Texas print, Texas mm -hmm. finally printed it. But he did a segment, he did a segment from, see, from the forest frontier to the farm community. And we could never have done that from here. He did that from the papers were, that were there in the New York Historical Society on Central Avenue, but what were also in Cooperstown. Now, just recently, I've worked with something that gave us another segment. I worked with a set of farm papers from 1804 through to 1908 when this person died. And it revealed to me something that I hadn't realized either, that and you think about now remember I showed you the little lady here with her apron and so forth and and uh, and how people lived in a log house and that wasn't commodious you're following you did your best and, and it was also important that you had enough wood right now you had wood that was laid up last year and was good and dry that would burn and so forth but at the same time while you were burning up on a good day like this you got yourself out and you cut some more and drew it <laughs> down so that you could have a good fire well, this, this life was so programmed that we lost some of it, all right? So they probably had a cow, and then, and a cow, you know, this is the most wonderful thing. So every year she gives you a calf, and that calf grows, and it's never, uh, it, it's always growing. It's always in progress. And so as you, possibly you had a 100-acre farm. Well, maybe you've got 30 acres that's tillable. And the rest of it is maybe you've got 30 acres of pasture, and then you've got some woods on it, and you've got to figure on marketing the woods. But at the same time, unless you've got enough, you know, so you've got pasture. Unless you've got enough, that cow had a calf, and then three years, three years' time you got some more. And as your herd grows, so you've got to have a building to store your hay in, and you've got to have stable enough for those animals. But you also have got to have enough you can put up hay 
but you've got to have animals enough to chew it up, to eat it. Now, right now, if you go up Route 11, it's amazing, all the hay that's baled up there, and they don't have cows enough in the country to eat that hay up. One of the things that this area did that I really had lost was that one of the things after the railroad came, you could market your hay because down in New York City and over in Boston and Connecticut along the, the, the ocean and so forth, you, need, you had drays that were hauled by horses and you had to have hay for them. And they're just, all the farms had, were sub, had become suburbia and our area had all this extra hay and we had an individual that put together a wire tied hay press and with that railroad that went across from 1851 on it could go across to Boston and so there would be a, a crew in the fall you know you'd start in in the fall and uh, listen this is a job because once you put hay and you put some weight on it you gotta know how you put it in to take it out right <laughs> it's harder <laughs> and so uh, you would have a crew in the fall it would work in the barns and you'd have that press going with this I, these horses on a treadmill to make it go and this man had all these headings of uh, the people that worked for him but the people uh, where he bought the wire the wire to tie and so forth and uh, there, in fact the name S-A-B-R-E up in Ellenburg that man had a billing head of Sabre and see in Ellenburg you've got that old hay press barn that was on the on that pond there that belonged to the Tom Hobbs and so forth and uh, that has just lately gone down but and so up there they and all that wonderful land they didn't have cows enough in the country to eat all that hay up and so that was shipped to Boston now in the meantime this man in the, this set of records that we have it just shows how that he also he owned this hay press and uh, uh, was shipping and one of the things that's sad in it is that uh, he had this letter from this commission agent because you sold things to a commission to a commission agent and you just prayed you got your money we don't realize and those nice big tanks go in with the milk and they take your milk out but it's guaranteed you get a salary you get your milk check but back in those days so here is a letter from this this man this commission house and the gentleman is kind of like a dear John letter and he is saying you're going to be disappointed with this check, but a great deal of your hay was spoiled. The roof of that freight car must have leaked, and I could only sell a bit of it. And I thought, oh, and really, this hurt that man awfully because he had paid for that hay, you follow? And how you really get gypped, and, and listen, that is written in too because the Rays, who sometime or other I should have a Ray um, assortment of things out here because John Ray lost in 1936 or 7 John Ray lost all the apples from his orchard over here which is where the school is Beekman Town Central and Charlie Harrington is a lawyer tried to help him get them he, they shipped those in barrel heads you know they shipped them in barrels and um, and I know that the Andersons lost all of theirs too so that is, there's a great deal that's happened in marketing and this set of papers that I received that I've been working on at this farm one of the things they had was they had made an agreement with Beekman to buy that piece of land in 1804 in 1835 they have a receipt from Beekman it's the first time I've ever seen one and I have to make some agreement somehow or other to, I'm not sure how we're going to expose these things the other bit that that was there that I was happy with other than this letter that showed me about about wire tied hay and about the commercial agricultural bit that we had in a certain segment of time before you had cows enough in the country before you got marketing and milk just like that auction there of the West Beekman Town Creamery because Derma's League had put that row of plants down through here. One of the other things is um, a receipt from the Plattsburgh Dock. That's what it says. It's just like a, it's a receipt. Plattsburgh Dock and it's in October of 1860 and so it is a receipt with Beckwith's signature on it and it is for a tonnage and one of the things was a winnower and a winnower is you know to fluff up hay so it'll dry in the sure. field and so forth but the important thing about that was that everything that came in had to come in by by water because we didn't have a train south out of here until 1875 you see so that and from October when the boats couldn't or November the last bit of freight that came up here if you didn't have it on that you'd go without it in the winter time whatever because we really were in fact that's why Burlington grew beyond us because Burlington always had a road out Jeffrey Amherst in 17 
59, put that road over, and then uh, Allen picked it up and brought it up to Colchester so that um, so that Vermont in Burlington always had an access in the wintertime, whereas we have that Willsboro Mountain, you know, that goes right on there oh, where yeah. the lake is, uh, it's 800 feet oh, deep yeah. there. All right, and so the, the DNH put a tunnel through there, a 600 foot tunnel, but not until 1875. Please. All right, we're back on again. Let's talk about some more things on the table here, Addie Shields. We're talking with Addie Shields in Beekmantown in the town hall. She's the historian here and for the entire Clinton County. And well, just listening to the lady for five minutes will give you a tremendous education, at least a, a pique your interest in the history of this area. What do we got here? Well, many people come here searching. You know, people love uh, people love their grandparents. And actually, you know, there's a time frame from uh, 1800, uh, well, from 1785, the Platts came here and then we had settlement. But then as the French moved down into here, we do not have any records until at St. Joseph's Church in 1833 and 43 and then St. Peter's. So there's a period of time when you may not have the documentation you need for genealogy. And so, I call that being hung on a nail. They just, they, but when they come, my point is, please don't do this unless you love these people. You need to know the social setting these people were in. You need to know what they were doing, what they felt bad about, what they were happy with, and so forth. And so this pleased me, though, very much. When these people, this, these people, the Selleks from Montpelier came, and they were searching old Mr. and Mrs. Blair, and they had these pictures. Now, up here where the farm is on Route 22, as you go back whichever way, beyond the school, the uh, farm, the dairy of distinction where the Ganyas live, just this side of this was a little house. And when I, my grandfather, when when my father, when I went to school down here, my mother would send these two little people. I didn't know very much about it, but I would take, as I went to school, I had my dinner pail, but I also would have a little pail of buttermilk, because the farmer could always give buttermilk away, okay? And I went down there once with, with my father with uh, a little market wagon of potatoes when he did his potatoes in the fall. My father called him Louis. So these people came and they had these pictures. Well, yes, I remembered because when I went in there, I could see that this man had what we call dropsy now and with no medicine. And this little lady, they were Catholic people, and the ladies from St. Peter's would come and bring them things, bring her things, and she made rugs. She and. And I'm not sure what she, these people now have a chair that this man, now this, that this man made in the house, that was in the house and so forth. But let me say, please, see this wagon right here? Can mm -hmm. you see that wagon? Sure. About the time of the end of their life, he sold off everything. And when he died, somebody made him a coffin and nobody, embalmed him. There wasn't money enough for that. And they barely got him buried, and he's buried up in St. Joseph's in West Z. But I can remember seeing him so fragile, and, and you know, the house had wooden floors, and they had a, a wooden sto a stove to burn wood, and it was frugal. And my father called him Louis. My father, in the fall, brought him some potatoes. He had more potatoes than what he needed. Because Louis was sick, and he never had any welfare. And so here they are with their children. And if you went down the Ashley Road, there's a little house there that Myers lives in, which is the house that, that, that crosses. And here they are with their children. But as we put this together, you, we helped them because we're at the cemetery. But here are the McClellan records. And you do realize that McClellan did something for the for Clinton County that very few counties have anything like we have in the McClellan, the McClellan Cemetery records. He did 153 cemeteries. Now they did this over a period of time from 1933 to 66. And the wonderful thing about it, he had an overview. McClellan was the individual who did the Samuel D. Champlain Monument, and he did other uh, um, he did other buildings and so forth. But in his, in the end of his life, he saw something. There are none of our cemeteries in Clinton County that are charted. You know, uh, 
somebody must have known how to place those three by six by by six, you know, and, and make them all parallel so they come out all right. Uh, but now St. Peter's, you go into St. Peter's and they've got a wall there and there's like little match strips and they know where everybody's buried. Now St. John's doesn't because that old that that old um, the old Rome, the old RC over on Peru Street was the first cemetery for our Catholic people, but so with the McClellan records, now Rabidou has since Rabidou picked up McClellan did 153 of them. But they quit in 1966 when he stopped. And, and you know, that was a tremendous thing that he worked for 33 years doing this. And, um, and he did this because there are no records. All you've got is what's on a monument. And if it isn't on a monument, that person is an unmarked grave and it's lost. There's no documentation of it. Now Rabidou came along in 2000 and Rabidou is a computer expert. And so he would borrow one of these cemetery books and he would come back and he would put that on the computer but he went and then he found the other people that were buried alongside there to bring so Rabidou has brought our records up to 2002 and and for the loan of these from the county office he'd he'd take one under his arm and then he came back when he printed them he gave us some but we did this because of because this old gentleman was a carpenter but they lived out what they had because of, of the pay scale. He was probably, he may have received more than other people, but they never owned a piece of land, is what I wanted to say to you. And so many people did work entry level. Um, do you realize that our French really have uh, blossomed since the uh, Second World War? The Pellerins and so forth. Uh, and this, of course, this, I, I owe a debt of gratitude for this book, and I've been very careful of it because it's so fragile, and we keep it in the vault. I got it out today for that. But that shows you the hard time the, <coughs> the French had. Now, Chauvin was, uh, so they had a budget. A school teacher was working for uh, $8 a month and uh, $14 for a season. It all depended on what bargain that you could have with her. And somebody, when, when, when the people brought wood in, you had to bring your wood or if you wanted those kids to go to school. And if not, you had to pay. But somebody had to, they brought four foot wood and somebody had to cut that. And the Chauvin's cut that. And you can see now the Chauvin's have done very well. They lived up here be west of the turnpike. But you could just see they were not in the leadership. They were an entry level. And that man was very happy. I think he got, 26 and they bartered on that whether it was 26 or 27 cents a card for splitting and piling and putting it in the right place pretty good by today's standards eh? and, well and louis and louis who has died in illness down here in a nursing home louis is one of the persons who you remember they had old bushel baskets that were tin they were metal about this size and louis used to talk about carrying those up three flights of stairs you know all those apartments along there where merkel's is and there were apartments up there and they got, what was it, 25 cents a bucket for carrying them up there and delivering it and so forth. So that the French, when the French came down, they had a hard time. They really did. So these old school records are very, very valuable. I've seen the one from District 3, and now this is from District 5. And I think uh, those are the only two that exist, and three is up at the college, isn't it? Up at the special collections. Well, I, I, had, it in, I had it in my hands, and uh, from, we did a television from Mr., program from with Mr. the Blake. Mi yeah. Mr. Blake and the plants, yeah. All right, then the other thing that this shows you is when the Irish came. Now, McCoy. <laughs> The Magalis came, though. So in um, about the time of the Civil War, the, the Irish came, and it's amazing. So he became the trustee, and um, it, you can see the difference in the fluctuation of the price of wood. You can see, um, uh, and you can see how the Irish hired the Irish, and so the Kate Rooney's and the Nell were, became the school teachers, and so forth. So that, um, now one of the things, I've only gotten to 1872, and doing, doing this, these records from this farm has kept me from completing this. I had intended that every Friday in January I would work on this and finish it so that people could read it. But uh, when I was called into this farm to see these, you better do things when you're asked. And and so I've had been curious about that. But um, but the McCoys are interesting because she tells she writes beautifully 
and this is this is Anna McCoy Parkinson Janak, and it was so interesting that in her, as they were just in their courtship, the thing they did would be from up west west of of the O'Neill Road on the Parkinson's Corner. The thing that they did at night was to go down to West Chazy to watch the flyer go by. <laughs> And the train has been very important to all of us. They didn't go far, you understand? Sure. And that was a time when gasoline was 10 gallons for 98 cents, remember? Oh, boy. <laughs> now the boy. Other, yes, well, the what's, other. The, what's the story on this tree with Joyce Kilmer? Well, she... she uh, Letter to, to, to the editor about destroying the tree that uh, inspired that wonderful poem that we're all familiar with. Mm -hmm. Huh too late to do anything about it. The criminal can never be published or punished. I still want to bring it to the... It's wonderful. I've never seen that, and I had no idea that that might be... Uh... She's a great gal, and she writes very well. Well, she we've, we've talked about well. the Catholic summer school for girls, and maybe that's where the tree uh, was located. I didn't know that. One time, a now famous poet visited the summer school, was so inspired, he wrote the poem, which gained his fame, and the yeah, beautiful Joyce tree... Too. Yes was located here in the North Country, and That's I never right. knew that until just now today. Right. I knew there was a very good reason for me coming she here She tells today. in this of how the, the, the smugglers would come down and hear all the various roads to come from Canada, and here was Parkinson's Corner, and there was a stone wall there, and, and they would uh, hide, the troopers would hide in back of there and so forth. She, she does that very well. The other bit that we have is Goodman Kelleher. Now, this is the only story we have of Rand Hill other than what, uh, there have been other things that have been written, but um, <clears throat> he owned the Majestic up at the... <coughs> oh yes, Goodman the Majestic, Kelleher sure. Owned the Majestic up at the uh, Lake Placid. We have so much to show you. All right, what's this? Auction oh, no. sale, Thursday, March 28, 1912. Let's see, and you're, in, you're into your Irish again. And oh, see, there's a, yeah. You read what they got there. Look at the, the items distributed. A bay mare, a brown horse, McCormick mowing machine, nearly new, eight tons of hay, rakes, harnesses, buggy wagons, cutters, uh, plows, cultivators, tooth harrows, chains and forks, shovels. Oh, isn't it wonderful? And we're talking about 1912. Yeah, but you right? see that? They didn't have 24 cows. Now you take yeah. right now, you've got 500 or 1,000 cows. Sure. And you see, uh, how many cows have they got there? Do they, do they, they pro have they got any cows there? Um, here you go. One three-year-old cow, one ten-year-old cow. See? See what we got? Potatoes. Fifty bushel of potatoes, 20 hens, two pigs, 20 cords of hardwood, one light harness. Now, what happened is that most people on a farm, you know, if you really, it's hard not to wear yourself out on a farm. And so why were these, now one of the things I've got to look at, I've got to find out how old this man was when he sold this to, to really do good, to really understand what was happening here. But see, he only had two horses, see that? Sure. And he didn't have a lot of cows. Very, very interesting. Well, you've, had, you've got so many wonderful now, things here. We also, we've asked everybody in the county to have veterans lists. And so our veterans list starts with the American Revolution. We know where all our people are buried and goes down through all of the wars. We've got a veterans list. Do all most of the towns have these? or? Well, I asked them too, and uh, I understand that Mr. Bowman, and he's going to be a part of our workshop, Mr. Bowman in the town of Chazy and the American Legion, he is going with Mr. Martin, and they are putting, uh, he's drawing maps and putting numbers down for, and, and labeling those as to who those people are that are buried there relative to being able to put flags out. And no, uh, now in our, in our Beekman town, uh, I put out flags with the little Van Stockham son and um, I know where things are and we've got a chart on that and one of the things we've got to do is is put some numbers on ours and uh, so that um, and I don't have a map of this here our map of uh, sometime or other you've got to go to 
we've got to do the cemeteries to really show you in where our, our people are. You do realize that in our Beekman town, our first assemblyman was uh, Thomas Treadwell, and he's buried down there in back of uh, the Monty Farm on Route 9. And then um, uh, our uh, Lon Dominey is buried here in East Beekman town, and he was our assemblyman, as was Mr. McFadden. And the only way that Mr. McFadden is mentioned, he became the supervisor, and he is on that list, uh, on that chart where the supervisors are. But we've had a lot of people that have um, carried the mantle of responsibility and so forth. So right from the beginning, right up to the Persian Gulf. One thing I want to mention before we leave this room, and it's right over back here, this book about Roy Pierce, because uh, uh, as many of my friends know, uh, Roy Pierce was a, a fixture in our community for a long, long time, and, well, and his dad was there, and I wrote a wonderful ghost story about a, a building there in Morrisonville, but Roy Pierce was just a delightful gentleman, and it well, was nice to know him. He lived well up into his 90s. Well, I knew him very well because Roy Pierce was our mailman. He had Route 1. He came out Route 22 and then curved around, came up here and see the divider. Now, this is West Chazy. This is not West Chazy. It's just the rural that when the federal government lays out routes, they do them so they're efficient. So Roy Pierce had this part, and um, wait a minute, and he he went to um, he went up the uh, uh, up the Duran Road and then up the Turnpike and around. That was Route 1. And then this part here was Weshez. Okay, so he was my mailman. So I did this back in... 22 years ago. Yes, 1982. in 1982. And now Roy Pierce had the only Pierce book and I believe he gave it to the college, the Special Collections, but he... And so he allowed me to copy these things. And you notice I did this, a pen etching of it. But then I did his family because he was related to Charlie Harrington. And his old, his old relative was also the clerk. And so there's his family. With, and we copied many things. And here we were again. This is before I put it on here. There's a chart, and there's a little house, which I was very disappointed when the, when the Methodist people didn't keep that house for a parsonage or something. And now it's a, it's a car sales place. And this is yep. the house. This is Louis S. Pierce's house in Plattsburgh, and that's where there was a dress shop there. Agnes, Agnes uh, had a dress shop, very exclusive shop there for years. And, um, but then... And I did all the, and the work of the surrogates and so forth. But then when you get over here, so then I did, when I visited him, and I wrote a story about him here, but when I visited him, I noticed this piece, he had wonderful things. So I took the camera, and this shows it. You realize that that is two pieces of furniture put together? Oh, well, sure. <laughs> and, and, and that was the neatest little house. Wasn't it a nice house? Oh, absolutely. Low ceilings and a, no, and a little pot-bellied yeah. stove and yeah. an old, old... F he wanted to install a yeah, lifeline one time, and he, he called me and told me he wanted to install a lifeline, so I sent them up there, and they said, his telephone's too old. He's got one of those old Bakelite telephones from the 1930s. And see, I went twice, and here he is in one set of... And here's the other, and it showed the layout of the house, and... I put these clips on before we came. He was a wonderful gentleman. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. And then his sisters were very important. Uh, and here's a catalog of the school. And here's his mother and sisters, and their pictures are in here. And then here's Wally Pierce. See, Wally Pierce was his. And Wally Pierce was uh, Wally Pierce died in 1945, and his, he was buried out of the Trinity Church. This uh, is a relative of Roy's? Yes, but he became our United States uh, rep House of Representatives, like McHugh. So would this have been lot. his brother, do you think, or a cousin, <coughs> no, or cousin, you don't know? Cousin, cousin. cousin. And then, see, and we tie in, when you do research, you tie in the cemetery records, and... <coughs> <laughs> and then he had other things, and, and okay, and, and so he allowed me to copy. This is out of his, his Parker and Weaver genealogy and so forth. So that really is a volume on, on Roy, and he allowed me to copy all of this. Okay, see the old school? And this, was the, this was the article that they wrote in the school, the Oracle, in 1922, when his sister was uh, 
No. And, and the other bit, too, is that um, in Scala Falls, the new historian, someone, he's doing it, Marvin, Marvin Connor, and somebody has given him the, um, he's got the old uh, photograph albums that, that go with this, the school pictures and the dedications, the bridges and so forth in Scala Falls. But I'm glad you spotted that. Oh, it's wonderful because he was just an icon there in the North Country and his dad ran a store there before he did right across the road and you know and he his took his grandfather care. was a clerk yes. in 1845 when, when our buildings burned and and it is grandfather when the buildings burned there's a letter there uh, when the buildings burned the old seal to send it to the controller you had to have a seal as we do and it burned the one with the fish on it burned and so there's a letter there from controller telling Lewis S. Pierce to do another one all right, we've got the camera going again, and we're looking at District 5, just so people can geographically get a little perspective about what that wonderful, that wonderful old book that you have that we showed about District 5, where it was actually located. Uh, up here. Yep, District we've got District 5, it. on the turnpike, up here. On this wonderful map, which is, which is a blown-up version done by this gas company who were trying to establish a gas... Uh, uh, company because um, where the Spellman, where Alice Bubbins' farm was, was the Spellmans had a place there which was, uh, people came in the summertime because of the sulfur waters and uh, there are there are some of the wells that would have sulfur water in this area and so Alice Bubbins had this map, made a copy of it for herself, but gave us the town. Now at the same time as we approached the bicentennial, we um, we had to do something, and so Alice asked me if I would do, and so in about two months' time, we put this book together. One of our problems, though, was the agreement with, I did not know. I was busy trying to make it justifiably a history to show our beginnings and so forth, and it's, it, um, the printer, first thing I knew, the printer wanted the masters and so forth, and so um, the pictures were labeled, and somehow or other when it came back, the, the labels aren't on them, and so I've been a little bit embarrassed. But I have, it is quite correct, and it does tell the story of um, the first when, when uh, Benjamin Morris first came back here, and somewhere in this area here, and, and when he came back here to about in this little bay, and, and uh, it is in, uh, uh, so the Battle of Yorktown was 1781, and it took him uh, a couple years for, uh, to come back here. And when they got back here in, in 1783, uh, here in this area, they also had with them all of the French who were absent with the rebels who could not return home. And um, so uh, Moors went back to, uh, Massachusetts and apparently they planted turnips here and they built a place but then the French went on we'll have to use the other map to show where the French uh, and in 1786 the government our new little government in New York established the law the um, land office and gave them the Canadian refugee the Canadian Nova Scotia refugee track but it doesn't show on this map can we see the other one sure well let's go look at the other map Okay, we're back at another map. You wanted to talk about churches, you wanted to talk about the forest the land, you want to talk about a few other things. Well, when our people first came here, and, and see, oops. Watch your step. <laughs> yeah. uh, <clears throat> looking at this, this is where Moore came. Now see, and, and we didn't have a government until, we didn't have settlement enough until 1820 when they established a government. But when Moore came here, the thing that was happening <clears throat> he came with the Fizettes and the Laplace and the Clotier and so forth. He went home to Haven, New Haven, in, but his French people went back up here in this area. Now this is the fertile part. This is the Lake Plain area. And you can see it. This is a school map. Notice how this green and then this other. This is the Spelman fault line and then you get into the mountains. And of course, again, our inheritance from the French, the Seigneury, the Gautier, see the, all right. <clears throat> when, they, when they went back up here, they had hard time living in the wintertime. And they could not go back to Canada because of the Quebec Act. 
in, in 1774 when you had the Boston Massacre, uh, please, uh, Great Britain and Parliament were worried that Canada would come in with these rebellious colonies. And so she made the Roman Catholic Church legal up there. But at the same time, Great Britain made them knuckle. She made the priests have two sets of records. But that's wonderful because you've got, wait a minute. The priest had his record there, but then he had to copy and make a second record to be placed with the proto-notary, which is the same thing as our clerk. So you could trace the, the French up there. Now, in the meantime, when these people came back with more right here, as I said, more went so we could sleep in a warm bed over here in New Haven, Connecticut or wherever, but <coughs> they were out here. They could not go back home. They were rebels. They were absent with the rebels, and they were placed so in the church. And one of the things Great Britain had right here at Point of Fur, on the end of that point, which is very controlling, uh, she had her fort right there and at Point of Fur. And these people here in the summertime when they when they would put uh, they would cut swale grass and they lived as Indians and and ate venison and pulled onions and did the best they could these people on the fort would come over here and burn them out and so forth now when they did and they had been promised land if they would fight if they would join with the rebels and they'd been a part of Moses Hayes's contingent so our little government down in Albany, by 1786, she gave them what is the Nova Scotian Refugee Tract, which is a part of Scala Falls, this part, a part of Scala Falls, Beekman Town, Altona, but she gave them this good land. So many of our French that had this good land kept that, but many of our French who had where the glacier skyward off the tillable stuff here in Altona and so forth, uh, they, it is McClellan and Noah Moore who said that they, they swapped that off for a bag of flour, a bolt of cloth, or some tobacco. So that uh, our, we do have a contingent of French that were left here because they fought with Moses Hazen. They fought all the way down to Yorktown and uh, were a part of the defeat of Cornwallis and were given that land. Now, in the meantime, when you look at government, this was all wild. This was wild. So that our people, they were in the flyway. They had the fish in the streams. They had the forest at their background here. And there was Venzen and so forth. They had to be very programmed people to live. And they built their habitations. And as you can see, some of them built a stone. And uh, then in Beekman Town, there was deposits of clay. And so by the 1850s you began to have brick houses and so forth but it and in marketing anything that was marketing had to be marketed off of this as we showed in 1851 when you get the railroad across the top of the state see how that took produce over to boston no, not the princess and so uh, then you got your lighthouses when they began at Ross's Point to transship and get stuff for down here something for Plattsburgh something for Burlington and so forth one of the bits is churches. You can see this a long, narrow, it's narrow in here, so it has a government in 1820. Now, in the meantime, you've got governments up here. Champlain had a government and Chasey had a government in 1804. All right, and we have this in 20 and Saranac comes in 1824. These people traveled by water. Everybody along the lake here had a little boat you know, a, a boat that you rode, and everybody knew how to whittle and make oars and so forth. And so they went back and forth this way. And, and at first, how were they marketing things? Now, we have, see that 45th degree latitude? Sure. That 45th degree latitude is very important because if you go over to Boston, there isn't a good mast for a wooden ship. And back in when we were being settled and so forth, the American Revolution prior to that and down to the time of the Civil War, all of our boats were wooden. And from Boston down, there wasn't a good mast to be had. But north of Boston, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and those wonderful rivers had oak trees and pine and spruce that would be wonderful for masts that would be 100 
125 feet high and six foot on the butt that would stand the wood, the strain for a wooden boat that was a schooner and so forth. So that, at first now, at first, before we were developed, when you're over here and you can visualize that New England and Boston's over here, the Bostonians became very jealous of New Hampshire people because, oh, New Hampshire people had all this timber and, and they could drop a tree and, and limb it and drop it over into the river and bring it down and sell it to these boats and they would go back to France and to England and they had Limoges China and uh, fancy carriages and fancy fancy trappings for a horse that all came from England and so there became a little problem between New Hampshire and Boston and the New Hampshire people did not want their kids to go to to the Boston Bostonian colleges because they pick up bad habits and so New Hampshire started Dartmouth. Now in the meantime, the other thing, when these soldiers been back up and down through here in the war of eight, in the American Revolution and in the Valcor business and in the war of 1812 and so forth, they realized how we had all these pines up here. And so now they'd been cutting them before we became, uh, Lavoisier had been sent over here when all this belonged to the French and Lavoisier had cut timber and then taken it up here. Massisquai, if we had a map over here, you've got Massisquai, all that, that place where Roberts and his men walked um, 11 days through water up to their knees, Roberts, Ran Roberts Rangers, okay, all right. You can hide over there. Pardon? Is it Rogers Rangers? Rogers Rangers? Yeah. Yes. All right. Yes, excuse. And so so a great deal of our pine was cut off, but still there was enough of it. And if you had, and see, when, when a, a, an animal has a calf, it isn't always a heifer. It can be a male calf, and the male calves were made into oxen. And so if you had a yoke of oxen, you could, if you had a good pine tree that was saleable, you cut that pine and snake it down so that many of our rafts, and I'll show you where most of our rafts, in this area, especially in this, now this big town shore, there's hardly a good sand beach in any of this. This is all, that's an upthrust. In fact, uh, it's an upthrust. It's a, and so, um, if you were, and you think about this, now wait a minute, you got no rubber boots. You got no rubber boots. What you got is, is a hide, and you know a hide gets wet and it gets slippery. The best place to make, to build rafts, when they built rafts to send all of this timber up to Montreal for the British Pond Sterling is right here. And I have looked at that tavern right there, and there's two miles between there and that tavern, and apparently they cut that off, and that little place right there by Ed Dragoons, that little cove right there is wonderful for, for sand. If you were going, to, now how are you going to lash trees together? You've got to have your feet on the ground some of the time, you follow? That apparently it was the best place for marketing. Now as time went on though, marketing from the Oliver Dock and the, um, the Oliver Dock and the Mooney Dock and then down here which we know as Halitz and so forth. But okay, now I'm we in the spring, we are putting a wayside marker out here. Now the lighthouse was just here in this furthest projection and that makes that little bay right there. Here's the lighthouse and there's that little bay from you see protected from south winds but also protected from the north winds and that's all right now in this contingent of papers that we have we have a consignment please father in heaven and where mr bertrand who and mr bertrand own the, this farmland right about in here and this is all good wonderful tillable stuff when he was shipping 150 bales of wire tied hay and he delivered them over here to oliver's and this is, I think, about 1877. And this is these papers that I was working with. All right, now, when it came to churches, so your first church is up here at Coopersville, up here to St. Joseph's. And you can see that the missionary priests to serve the Catholic people that came down here, they came that far down. And then they came down to the side of this river, and then they came down here to Keysville. But along the river, the Bertrands, in fact, one of the assessors there, Luck, that's in this other room, his old grandparents, Peter Lux, and people went to church when the weather let them. You know, farmers did, you worked when the weather would let you. You know, we, we go to work, you know you got a 40 hour week and you go to work every day. But, and, but, you know, all right. So they traveled 
up here by water, and you notice that Coopersville is inland. It's upriver and inland where it's safe because of the British being here until the John Jay Treaty, you see? And, 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 and this, this, this highway um, wasn't safe. You do realize in 1813, Murray came down before the War of 1814. In 1813, you had Murray's raid in which he burned stuff along the shore and so forth. So that church is inland. All right, so that's the first one. And then at about just a little bit beyond, you have this one. And then, by then, of course, you've got your Civil War. And when our boys went off the Civil War, they went off here, and many of them walked these dusty roads down, and they went off on a boat down here because we did not have a railroad until 1875. But All right, we paused for a moment. Now let, let's get to, uh, where are we in the churches now? Well, can you see, so that our people and our settlements were first here, and so our people went by water up here to St. Joseph's. Now at the same time, but this 1833 and then 43, but then an established church in 1853 when the Canadian brothers helped St. Peter's to be established, which was the biggest church. This was the biggest church in Clinton County at that time. All right, and so our people, can you see this? Since we're only four miles wide, our French people came down here. Now, we had, now the first church in the whole area is at 1796, the Presbyterian, and so the second one is 1817, when here in Beekman Town Corners, our, our Presbyterian church was established. And they said at that time it was seven miles north of in the establishment. So that when it came to churches, now, then East Beekman Town, 1833, and Point of Rush, in the 1850s, and then a church in West Beekman Town. And these churches went out with, they were closed down with the Depression and the advent of the automobile and so forth. But then let us look at timber. As they cut timber and so forth, now you can realize that all along here, anything in timber could, if you're cutting barrels, well, no. If you're cutting timber, it mostly went out in rafts right here in this nice place and so it would be hauled there with with oxen to go out but then as you cut timber and so forth the first mill see where that where that that brook comes across there mm -hmm. which is a part of the creek here several rivers come together down here in the creek all right that was our first mill which is down there where jim lives and then your second one here which is the Rays, and then up here in West Beekman Town, right there, there's, see that, there is the Cudwiths, right here. There's a mill right there, and that is Twin L's right now. Then, however, <coughs> milling had been going on here faster and, and um, much more um, financially probably better off, but something else happened in 1815. Uh, New York State created this as a highway so that if you lived on one side, you could not quarrel with this one, you could not block it off. So in 1850, this became uh, New York State Highway, the river. And at the same time, they built a plank road along here, this plank road. Now, one of the things they did about the plank road that no farmer would ever do, they bought the timber to build from Quebec and had to come down here and they went bankrupt, whereas most people would have started up here and <laughs> built <laughs> where you got a lot of timber and come down here with the timber. Now, however, Along the river, you've got a great deal in Plattsburgh when they dammed that up, and then there's two dams that they built. And then when you got up here to Marsonville, the thing about Beekman Town, when you got this far in, Twin Elms is over here, but when you got this far in, it was handier for Beekman Town to come down here to Roy Pierce's in that, that business there, you see? And then here's another to come down. Now you're into the, the timber line is moving to the west, you follow? You see how that the river and so the end of our mills was now Sanger had one over here right here that this part right here is Sanger's and and that mill is still going someone else still has it now but it's a small operation but can you see how that as we moved inland so we had these three mills but then these mills were going too and as you got over here <coughs> it was closer to come here than it was and they had more equipment to work with 
Okay, this is uh, Turnpike. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where's where was West Beekman Town? What's what's right what's there. the intersection? What's the That's intersection? it right there. Yeah, what's well, this road? Turnpike and what? Uh, okay. Um, mm, the Duquette Roads and uh, on, this is the O'Neill Road. This is where this this O'Neill Road right about there is where Loyal Smith was born. The little boy that gave Plattsburgh its city hall. Um, we gotta go. Road? Thank you, Marie. What are they? That's right. And, and incidentally, the, the Dupuis that you saw, he came. So in uh, 1835, La Plante was up here. Yeah, this is the Duquette Road, and this is uh, La Plante. La Plante Road. Pardon? Seymour Road. And the Seymour Road. Okay, good. All right, good. We're getting help from the gallery here. We need that. Yeah. The La Plante Road and, and, and the Seymour and Road. The other bit, too, is that in 1835, when the La Plantes were up here, and in 1827, they were establishing this, this District 5. And see, you got an 8 on here, you got an 8 on here, and a 4 or 5. They took 8 off in it as these people, as, these, as this area had more children and so forth. And at first, they had 55 people that went to that school, but it came all the way down here. And then they developed that 8. But so Peter LaPlante, in 1835, Peter LaPlante was up that far. <clears throat> and, the, and that's where the Civil War caught him. And the, and the mill was up here to Cudworth. And, <coughs> and, uh, and so that Dupuis probably, uh, look, nobody took a horse out of the barn. If you needed to go somewhere, you, you walked. And so he, he apparently, and when he joined on the Civil War, he apparently came down here. And then, and you realize how that for a young man who had taught French and only spoke a little bit of English, he became bilingual when he worked with the rest of the soldiers. But you realize how he saw the world when he went down here and went down to Maryland and you follow, and, and then returned and when he came back and so forth. And, and, uh, but he had the skills of being, uh, and his father before him and the LaPlantes had the skills of being timber people along with this person here the Cudworths, who, who had, who had the investment of the saws and so forth. Now the other bit too is you visualize what they were, uh, their buildings. Look, if their buildings were slab wood, if they were log and slab wood, you know they were very primitive. And this is the time when they were very frightened. It's in 1855 that um, there is a story about um, there were so many wolves, and, the, and you know wolves will come in, and, and you see them as they move in on a kill. They'll move in and back off, and they'll tease, tease and bite and hurt and so forth. And they would decimate a flock of sheep, and see all these people had sheep because well, because you needed it for your clothing because, yes, there was some calico coming in from England, but they were raising flax. You know, they had garden ground for potatoes and turnips and so forth. But these people, when Peter Plant was up here, they were living on venison, they had honey, they had bear meat. And, and every time that you caught that, that you were able to, you know, you had a hide with every one of those. And either you used the hide yourself or it became saleable when you had a peddler, and this is the period of time when peddlers did it. Now, Nussbaum, uh, Vilas, uh, Ben Feinberg, you know, the story of the Nussbaums when they came to New York City in 1850. He lived in New York City for two years, but you can conceive the fact that you couldn't make a living in New York City. There was too many people coming all the time. But these people up here were isolated. And if you had a little bit of money, so that you had a horse and a cart, and you could be a peddler and you could come along here and buy a, the, the wood ashes from a stove and the hides that people had and you took some calico and some tin, you could make a living. And Nussbaum, Nussbaum for sure, you know what Ben Feinberg did, but Nussbaum became the individual who started the Jewish church and at the same time he had a big store which was known as a beehive right there where the Merkels were and then the other bit is his wife died and so he's she was buried there in the cemetery uh, off from uh, South Catherine Street he had five daughters and one son and his wife was gone he sold out and he went to Chicago and Christopher Ogden has brought us this, and Christopher Ogden, you know, did the biography of Thatcher, and he brought us this wonderful story of how Nussbaum's son, Aaron, Aaron got in with Marshall Field, and they started Sears Roebuck. Our, our peddler that did this area here, 
our peddler's son started Sears Roebuck. And actually, right now, uh, the daughter was married to Rosenbaum, who was affiliated in that. And so that, so that you look at people's horizons. Now, we got maps in there, and you know, you take an atlas, it's got all these route signs on it. But these people knew what the Indians knew, and they knew where you could sell something, and they knew what, what they had. Like, you know, a man would look his pasture over, and you got an ash tree over there, and you know, and you, and you feel ash is very workable. It's easy, it makes a wonderful plank, or you got oak, or you got hemlock. The other bit, too, is that a great deal of, of some of our stuff was going into hemlock at the time of the Civil War because of its ability to, for, tanning, for tanning shoes. And so during the Civil War, we really, uh, well, first, we, yes, we were augmented in that, in that we continued to cut the timber and you had to go further up here. And you see, when you went from, that is Cudrus. And when you went a little bit further inland, you don't go very far in chopping, you know. <laughs> it takes, a, all right. But as you got into here, this built, this came down, any timber here came down to this or, or came over here. Now, the other thing, there became, at the time of the Civil War, a great demand for barrel staves because the tin can back there was the barrels, the butter tub and so forth. And the other bit, all right, so, so as they, um, for, all right, as you took a log to Cudworth and somehow you got some money for it and Cudworth was, was filling the order for barrel staves and so forth and that's what Beekman was shipping out of down there too, barrel staves and uh, wooden products. Interesting background, just tremendous stuff. You had a few more things you want to show us in our office, in your office before we go and this has been quite a Quite an odyssey, our little trip since we came here a couple hours ago. We'll wrap it up in your office, okay, Addie? Okay. Please notice, though, how Isla Mont leans in, how Beekman Town thrusts out, how that when the route came, it, you, it, it, you had to bend in here, and here, that's why you got a lighthouse, but at the same time, think of this, that if you stood along the shore here, you could have seen Champlain, you could have seen any of the activity in, in 1666 when the Caragan Saint Laurent went south to punish the Indians, you, and then see them come back bedraggled and so forth, you would have seen it where, from this shoreline. You would have seen it from anywhere. Now, you look at Vermont, and Vermont is wonderful too, but they had the islands which were a maze where you could hide, and you could hide and build ships down here at Colchester and so forth. You follow? Mm. Whereas our shoreline wasn't safe. Wasn't safe, but you could have seen everything. Do you see? Yep, sure can. And, and do you, well, okay, all right. Okay, there is a story too. Uh, Art Cone has been, Art Cone has, has um, positioned all the wrecks, and there's one wreck out here, one wreck out here, in which a family had cut stone because they were building that, for, they were building Fort Montgomery up there, and therefore, and this was after the Civil War, and therefore they cut stone for what they, and they put it in a bateau, and when they got out here, oh, the south wind caught them, and something happened with the sail and the rope around a man's foot, and he drowned, and they lost their load of stone. It's right out there. The scuba divers, well, Randy Larkin used to talk about it, and um, there's a place there where it's, it's shallow because the, the rocks are there. But, and it is Art Cohn who, um, who uh, called asking about that, and they, they found the clipping in the paper. Of, so that there's a lot of sorrow along with this, too. Oh, there sure is. Yeah. And Fred Godfrey has written the book on, on um, canal boats and so forth, how with the last trip of the canal boats going out, how the south wind caught them and blew the, and you see the canal boats got all that side business to get caught <laughs> and pushed them towards the shore. And, you know, you've, it's, a, it's, it's quite a thing. I don't know how to sail a boat, but I can see all the troubles oh, yeah. that there might be. We came back to this map. When the engineers... When the engineers brought the 
the right wing of the British down through. We're talking about the War of 1812 again, just to let people know. Down through Beacon Town. You see, that's the south branch of the Chazy River, and right there is the high spot. And when they when they stopped overnight in Dominey's house, and Wellington had his breakfast there. That is the south branch of the Chazy River, but this business that starts here is the watershed of the creek that comes down here. And notice how, notice how the Delaware, the Delaware, the Delaware and Hudson line here, the Delaware and Hudson line circumvents this waterway. See that water right there? Sure. See how that creek kept the railroad from being able to, to come into Plattsburgh, you notice it comes in on an arc. But there is the high part. There is the south branch of the Chazy River, where, where the, where the engineers parked their men. That was the high spot right there, because that's that's the watershed of the Chazy River. But here's the watershed of the creek of what they've known as Silver Stream. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. All right. And there's the high spot right there where they parked their men. Now some of them were parked over here, where. Uh, the stone house of the of the Atwoods is right in there, but and they're parked there because there was water, and Aiken's volunteers came up as far as this area too, because they were they were um, trying to spy on them. But the British were parked there in that around that water business, and and it was the highest part because there's the great divide between the between the Chazy water the Chazy River watershed and this watershed of, of, of this one. Can you see that flows into the creek? Yep. We have covered so much ground today. So much time in history, so much, so much uh, area in Beekman Town and all the various other townships here in Clinton County. We hope we've instilled in you a little bit of the passion that this lady has had for all of her lifetime for history and that you and your children and your grandparents and your friends will start studying a little bit about the history in which you live it's it's hard for me to understand why some people wouldn't have an interest in the history of the place they oh, live yes. because it's just so fantastic isn't it Yes. Just so wonderful. Oh, yes. It's cause and effect. It's, and and it, uh, it involved people's lives. And so many people went down to their deathbeds just programming themselves, trying to survive this climate. And, and, and they had to pay their taxes. And uh, it was, and they had to mark it. And it's so hard to know where to mark it and so forth. Yes. You have pointed out to us how many different factors were involved in the growth of this area right from the very beginning. And it gives us a, a, it paints a picture, doesn't it? You start with one oh, brush stroke, yeah. and then you have to bring the railroads in, and you have to, and by the time you get to now, you have a pretty good picture of how we developed into what we have today. It's hard to do now because there's so many facets to it yeah. and so many factors and so forth. But we can be very proud of our heritage. Uh, wonderful people, just as Alice Bovins gave us this and our, our accountable women, our, our elected people and so forth. There's a lot that's gone on to, into this, yes. Addie Shields, Clinton County historian, uh, Beekman Town historian, involved in so many parts of the history of this North Country. Thank you so much well, thank for you inviting too. us into your <laughs> life you today. We hug. <laughs> thank you, too. We hug. We don't <laughs> shake hands. Too. Thank you so much, Addie. Best of luck with everything you do, and I can't wait to see what the next chapter in this great hist history lesson might turn out well, to be. Well, as we finish, I'll think of what we missed. I bet you will. So oh, yeah, we'll, we'll be back. <laughs> who said that? I'll be back. In any case, who knows where we'll be next time for our little corner.